I would like to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Michael Young. Dr. Michael Young is a senior research associate for the University of Colorado, Denver, and shoots medical campus in the Gibson lab where he develops technologies for nonlinear imaging of brain tissue. We will be recording this webinar and it will be available after the webinar. We'll send you an email with a link. After the webinar, we will answer all of your questions. Um, there is a Q&A button at the bottom of your, on your Zoom toolbar. Uh, go ahead and ask a question when you know if you have one available. Um, for those of you just joining us, welcome. Once again, I'd like to introduce Dr. Michael Young, who is a senior research associate for the University of Colorado Denver and Shoots Medical Campus. He will now share his expertise. Michael, welcome and please begin your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, for that introduction. My name is Michael Young, and this webinar is going to present a methodology for the rapid design of an objective lens for multi-photon microscopy from off-the-shelf lenses with no a priori design. Now, the techniques that I describe in this presentation are not limited to microscopy, multi-photon or otherwise, and they may be used for the synthesis of many types of lenses, many types of lens architectures, for example, camera lenses, telescopes, scan lenses, laser optics, and fiber couplers, just to name a few. So to begin, what is the first step of the design process? Well, it isn't jumping in feet first to the optical design. You also need to consider the more logistic elements of the project. Most projects can be viewed through the lens of the scope triangle of time, money, and quality. Custom compound lenses, particularly in quantities typical to research and development, this means quantities less than 10 pieces, are weighted heavily in all three categories. They require significant investments of both time and money to realize a high quality product. However, for applications where there are only a few strict requirements, compound lens designs can be created from scratch with no previous design using off-the-shelf lenses and tailored to the requirements of the application. In this presentation, a methodology is outlined for this rapid design of a compound lens suitable for use in multi-photon microscopy. The goal of this webinar is to help the audience learn how to identify their key system requirements, what does your optic need to do, what quantitative values represent that purpose or function, and which ones don't. To create from these requirements a representative merit function, the merit function will also include constraints that allow for a more accessible path to an off-the-shelf design, and to set up an initial lens design suitable for global optimization. This means where in the merit function topology will we begin? And then finally, to build a design from off-the-shelf or commercial off-the-shelf, otherwise known as COTS, components. So, why are we using COTS lenses? Well, let's consider the COTS lens from the perspective of the project scope triangle. A COTS lens is more readily available, usually between immediate availability and an eight-week lead time from the reception of the purchase order. A COTS lens is very affordable. It offers the designer the benefit of an economy of scale and costs, typically a few tens of dollars for the uncoated lens. A COTS design can be tailor-made to a few specific requirements. Without getting too lost in the weeds, it is important to also consider how the lenses are going to be mounted. In this presentation, I will assume that we are making an optic where all the elements are of the same diameter and that they will be fitted into a lens tube. The spacing of the lenses will be controlled either by retaining rings or custom spacers. The tolerances of the lenses will be primarily responsible for the centering, and the tolerances of the spacers will be primarily responsible for tilt and axial separation. Alternatively, we could make a poker chip design where each lens is mounted in a small cell beforehand and then placed into the lens tube. 
Now this could be advantageous as it would provide a way of using lenses that were not all the same diameter. Now what are the tools that you Now I've already mentioned the merit function and a little bit about the optimization design process. So very briefly, I will present an example of what a merit function is and what optimization means. So if you had a lens where you allowed the shape factor, which is a measure of the curvature of both sides of the lens, to vary and then optimized on an aberration such as spherical aberration, you would produce the graph on the right that would show that aberration as a function of your variable. Now this is a simple representation of the merit function. If you introduce different constraints and more variables, it may become very complex with many local maxima and minima. Now, local optimization methods will find these local minima, as the name implies. However, they tend to get stuck. A global optimization method is one that uses other techniques, for example, synthetic annealing, genetic algorithms, escape functions, and so on, to escape from local minima in search of the global minimum. Local optimizers may work for finding designs well suited for off-the-shelf synthesis as they tend to find solutions with small curvatures. However, better designs are typically found with the global search method. Additionally, you can constrain the merit function to only return curvatures that are available in the catalog. Regardless, it is usually true that the global design method will give you better solutions than the local. So just a brief comment on workflow. As you can see on the right, I've outlined a possible workflow for this lens design process. It's important for several reasons. Attribute a time commitment to each step and realize that the decision points are going to require a few iterations to make the process work. If you think that you can complete the project in a day, you should probably plan for three. If you think you can complete it in a week, you should probably plan for three weeks. Also recognize that during the decision points, it may be necessary to make substantial changes, such as changing the number of lenses, relaxing constraints in your merit function, or looking at different requirements. I would also recommend setting a maximum time for each step once the design reaches the target value. It is possible to mentally get stuck in the designer for better performance. You can work on any problem long enough to convince yourself that it can't be done. So we've now discussed the introduction. Let's dive into the design process and make the compound lens. There is a story of a farmer who was teaching his son how to dig straight rows in the ground. He told him to pick an object in the distance and regularly reorient on it as he dug the rows. When he came back, he found his son had dug zigzag rows from one end of the field to the other. Asking him why he didn't follow his advice, the son replied that he had, but the darn cow in the distance kept walking around. The design process is similar. If you can establish your purpose and requirements early on, it will reduce the time needed and prevent excess time spent on efforts that aren't productive. The first step in the design is to have a clear understanding of what your design is intended to accomplish or what problem it will solve. In some settings, this is called a concept of operations and defines the scope of the project. In general, answering the five W's, who, what, when, where, and how of the project will provide the insight that you need to capture most, if not all, of your requirements. In our case, a good place to start is to select an optic, like an objective lens, that is close to, but not quite, what we want. Perhaps the numerical aperture is too large or too small, the field of view is not quite right, or the working distance is not suitable for what our experiment demands. One example that I can think of from previous research is trying to image through a thick cryostat window that may be far from the sample. By using an existing architecture, we can use the optics specification and purpose to guide our own design. I've included an image here down below. Unfortunately, my video seems to obscure it slightly of a highly optimized objective design. You can see how complicated and how many lenses are involved in a standard objective. So once the purpose of the optic is clear, 
This purpose has to be translated into specific quantitative requirements. Our requirements will include both optical and mechanical constraints. Other considerations may include thermal or manufacturing constraints or tolerancing. Remember, the more constraints that you add, the slower the merit function will converge. If possible, it is wise to look for merit function operands, the term used in ZMAX, that directly address what you want to optimize on. As opposed to writing multiple operands that collectively calculate what you're looking for, or custom operands to find your solution. Also, some operands can address multiple surfaces or parameters simultaneously and thus, the reduce, and thus reduce the number required. One very useful tool for determining the requirements is the optical invariant. This value of a lens is a measure of its ability to gather light and represents a conservation of that value through the system. It provides an initial check on the bounds of an optical design and is nicely demonstrated in the two references that I've provided here from Pat Trota. Additionally, it is a good measure of the complexity of an optical system and it can also be used as a way to analyze and characterize the system. Here I have the requirements for my optical system. I have two example objectives that I took from the Opto Sigma catalog and I have my design requirements on the right. Now is probably a good time to point out the utility of a spreadsheet for calculating the first order values of an optical system. Not only will this allow you to quickly capture the values, but you can make them link via formula and will provide a nice sanity check on your values. For example, given a certain numerical aperture and focal length, this will set the entrance pupil diameter for your system. So you can see over here in the fourth column, which is labeled design, the requirements that we are going to be designing towards are a, an NA of 0 0.5, a magnification of 20, a field of view of 1.2 millimeters. We have our field number calculated here. Our transmission, we're going to try and get better than 80% transmission at two wavelengths. Our working distance, which we've taken from the an aspherical lens that I'll introduce later, is 15.7 millimeters. We're going to try and keep our parfocal distance the same and eliminate the need for a parfocal extender. Here are the model numbers of the example objectives, and here is the model number of the aspherical lens that I am looking at using for the front lens of the design, again, which I'll show later. We're going to try and keep the lens design to around 12 lenses with a focal length of 8 millimeters, an entrance pupil diameter of 8 millimeters, and a compatibility with a 200 millimeter focal length tube lens. There's a few additional constraints that I've put down here, such as a maximum lens thickness, a minimum lens thickness, and a minimum lens radius of curvature. These are again coming from the Opto Sigma catalog. Using some of the values above, I'll calculate a maximum field angle and the tube lens chief ray height to make sure that I don't clip on the tube lens. And where appropriate, I've included simple calculations in the comments for reference. So designing the merit function is an iterative part of the design process. It is garbage in, garbage out, like any program. If you write a poor merit function, don't be surprised if the lens design is poor or the merit function won't converge. Where possible, use a solve in the lens design to quickly reposition any surface or value where that would make sense. A good example is the par focal distance of the objective lens, the distance between the stop and the image or object. You can set this distance such that it will be quickly calculated in the lens design and the merit function will not have to optimize on it. Also, consider how you will set up your lens design. It may not be necessary to optimize on the numerical aperture if you set it up such that is a prescribed value. However, if you do so, the lens design will then have to aim the rays at the entrance pupil of the objective lens, which can be a very slow process. Alternatively, you could flip your design around and aim at the entrance pupil with no lenses in between and then set the numerical aperture as a target in your merit function. This would be much quicker.
with the merit function that I'll use for this design. You can see that I like to annotate my lines and that I call out different values. So here is the focal length, the numerical aperture, the par focal length. I also have constraints on the mechanics of the lenses, such as a maximum clear aperture, lens thickness, maximum air thickness between the lenses, a minimum air thickness, a minimum lens thickness in the center, and minimum edge thicknesses. One important thing to notice here is I have the numerical aperture weighted, but not the focal length, because both of those are coupled parameters. An additional page of my merit function. Here I have curvature constraints to constrain the lenses to stay within values found in the catalog. We have a working distance constraint with bounds of how far it can go from a set position. And I originally had a telecentric constraint, however, I removed that because it was too constrictive for the design. Here the default merit function begins, and I've included it down to the first line of the TRCX. In the design process, what you want to look for in the merit function report is that the TRCX operands, or the TRCY, should be the ones that contribute the most. All the other ones should have been sufficiently minimized. So now that we have our requirements, how do we begin the design? Well, when I took an optical engineering course on lens design many years ago, this quote was part of one of the classes in the introductory course. It can still be found in the current user manual for ZMAX Optics Studio, and it reads, you might ask, since computers are so fast, why not just try out every possible configuration to see which is best? To get a feel for the scope of that problem, consider a cemented doublet lens with six degrees of freedom. A degree of freedom manifests itself as a variable for optimization. If you assume that each variable can take on 100 possible values, that's a coarse sampling, then there are 1 times 10 to the 12th different possible systems. If each system evaluation requires the tracing of 20 rays, which is a low estimate, and you can trace a million rays per surface per second, then the time required is about 8 times 10 to the 7 seconds, or 2.5 years. For a 4-element lens with 16 variables, evaluated at 3 fields and 3 wavelengths using 100 rays for evaluation, would require 1 times 10 to the 32nd system evaluations, or many billions of times the age of the universe. So you get the idea that just knowing where to start may be difficult. Part of this presentation is to show you that it does not need to be so. According to Rudolph Kingslake, there are four options for starting a lens design. Options two through four involve having something from which to start. I jokingly call these the plagiarized solutions. Kingslake describes option one, a mental guess, as being practically impossible. Here, I will present a fifth option that doesn't require the same experience that Kingslake had and makes the process more accessible for other lens designers, particularly those ones just beginning their careers. For an example, the image on the right shows a starting design for a three-element apochromat. This design is somewhere in between what was described in the previous slide. Here's our starting design here. So one may expect that it will take between two and a half years and one age of the universe to find an optimized solution. Using the design process in the presentation, a diffraction limited 100 millimeter focal length lens with negligible focal shift across three wavelengths can be realized in under 30 seconds. So if a merit function can be thought of as a landscape or terrain of a topographical map, then one of, if not the highest points on the map, would be a design where each element has no optical power. This design method was pioneered by Berlin Brixner and has been around since at least 1963. Examples of this method have often used local optimization methods, and these result in relatively simple designs, especially if compared to something like a double Gauss lens. If you use the same beginning point, but with a global optimizer, new designs can be quickly found with no pre-existing design. Now, global optimizers are often advertised for use with existing designs to find new but similar designs to that original. They have also been demonstrated to be useful for synthesis of a design when no starting design is present. It is still important to consider some aspects of classical lens design 
when placing the powerless lenses, which I call equal plano lenses. A lens placed close to the image plane will often become a field flattener. Lenses made of certain glass, meaning flint or crown, will have a tendency of becoming negative or positive to satisfy the achromatic constraints. In our case, we will select a COTS lens for the first lens in the system from the Asphericon catalog. The rest of the lenses will be powerless. The selection of that first lens is very restrictive, particularly for large numerical aperture designs. Because we are asking for both a larger numerical aperture and a considerable working distance, using an aspheric lens is, for the final optic is a good choice. It will handle a considerable amount of the spherical aberration that is usually addressed through objective design techniques such as lens splitting. In lens design, it's not much to look at. I place variables on all the parallel plate lenses, meaning their curvatures and thicknesses, as well as the air gaps between the lenses. There are also variables on the working distance, and because this lens is going to be used for imaging in a thick sample, I also put a variable on the radius of curvature of the image plane. So now we have our merit function and our lens design and we can use our global optimizer to find some design solutions. This step is also fairly iterative. Sometimes designs will be found that are pathological, meaning non-physical, negative distances, overlapping lenses, things like that. And you have to go back into the merit function and introduce constraints that prevent those solutions. This feedback is apparent to the lens designer as he or she watches the evolution of the design. Additionally, the merit function will produce a merit function report, which will rank the strongest contrib contributions to the merit function. This is very useful if the merit function becomes very slow to converge. Oftentimes, this has very little to do with the power of the computer and more to do with a poorly chosen constraint in the merit function. It's also important to monitor how fast the merit function is proceeding, meaning how many systems it is evaluating per iteration. This can be drastically slowed down by using too many fields, variables, constraints, too many configurations, and also by using ray aiming. If you can try to minimize or avoid some of these things, it will quickly accelerate the rate at which the merit function is able to evaluate systems. So here is an example of how quickly the global optimization method can find a working, a workable design. I've opened the global optimizer, turn on auto update so I can watch it and click start. And now you can see the first solution is kind of crazy, but give it a moment. And ta dum there is something at least considerably better in just 15 seconds. So one of the things that you're looking for as this design optimizes is you're looking at the shape factor of these lenses. This design here that it just found is fairly amenable to a caught solution. A lot of these lenses I look at and I think I can either split them or I can make them Plano convex or Plano concave. A lens like this, this meniscus lens, would be a lot more difficult to simulate using Cotts lenses. So we're almost a minute in. I'm still letting it go. We'll see how, how far this optimization will take us. Notice down here in the spot diagram that over our field of view, we are already diffraction limited. This design might be a little bit nicer because it has a longer working distance. Anyway, I stopped the optimization there and you can see an example of the global design search. So a global optimizer will save several solutions for our review. It's worth noting that it's 
good to run the global optimizer even with the same starting file more than once as the search algorithm is stochastic or it can be. We need to consider how likely we are to find the lenses in the proposed solution out of the catalog. Are there many lenses that look like they are going to be plano convex or plano concave or equiconvex or equiconcave? Those are the lenses that you're going to most likely find readily available in the catalog. Do you have any meniscus lenses? Those ones are harder to find in a catalog. So let's look at the design that I've picked out from the Global Optimizer. We've got a couple of problem lenses I can see right away. We've got this very thick negative biconcave lens and we've got this meniscus lens. What we're going to do is try and split those into separate lenses and hopefully we'll be able to find those in the catalog. The other lenses such as this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, basically the rest, we're going to try and force them to have a shape factor of one, meaning they're going to be Plano on one side. So what I've done is I have split the double concave lens and the meniscus lens. And I have also forced all of the other lenses to have a shape factor of one. Now I start with the lenses that have the most curvature. And then I do a linear optimization in between each step where I have forced a plano surface, or in this case on this double concave lens, I've forced it to have a matching concavity. I do that linear optimization in between each step. But now we have a design that is ready for the COTS lens substitution process. So this part is, can also be highly iterative. It is best to begin with the lenses that have the strongest curvature and try to find substitutes from the catalog. As you substitute in lenses into the design, re-optimize using the local optimization tool. Something that you may have done, now we didn't do initially, is restrict the lens spacings in the global search to improve the speed of the merit function. At this point, you really want to make sure that those are free to move around as these small adjustments in distance help to correct for the changes that we're going to make to the lenses. Also, if you find that the lens you're trying to substitute isn't working well, you may consider changing the material of the lens. In our case, we've used BK7 lenses but Opto Sigma still has a large catalog of few silica lenses and that small change in material may be all you need for a solution. So down here is the fully COTS design. All of the lenses have been substituted for lenses that were found in the Opto Sigma catalog. So as you near the last lens for substitution, I didn't have this problem, but it may be that you have pushed much of the correction onto that last lens. I've run into this before. In this case, you may make the closest substitution and find that the system no longer provides the desired performance. You may have to return to a different global solution, begin again from the same solution, but change which lens you start with for the substitution, or you may consider splitting the last lens into two and optimizing. If these efforts are not successful, it may be worth considering a custom lens for the last singlet. A custom lens's cost can be minimized if it is designed using the test plates of the optical house. This will also allow for faster fabrication and reduced cost, as opposed to making a new test plate for a custom singlet. The lenses will probably all have the same coating, so coating cost will be minimal as they can all be coated at the same time. An additional consideration is that if you have a number of specific custom lenses that will be required, consider the number of prototypes or optical systems that are being built. Basically, can you take advantage of an economy of scale? Also, in your design are a number of lenses close to the same shape of this custom design. Maybe you can order enough of these singlets to get to a price break. Stated in the introduction, most projects can be viewed through the lens of the scope triangle. Our COTS lens design solution must be evaluated in terms of time or schedule, cost, and its ability to satisfy our requirements. By narrowing the scope of the objective's purpose, basically we restricted the concept of operations, we can reduce our cost and schedule for the design. Now, what follows is a comparison of our COTS optic to that of a similar 
objective lens that you can purchase from Opto Sigma's catalog. So this is, in some sense, a highly customized lens, but it's not a fully custom lens. Now, while objective lenses are readily available, consider that their transmission is usually lower as they must be corrected over a wider spectrum. Also consider that if there is no comparable match from a readily available objective lens, a fully custom optic is going to require a much longer schedule and a much increased cost. So here's the final performance for our design. We designed an objective lens suitable for use in multi-photon or nonlinear microscopy. Multi-photon microscopy favors objectives with large fields of view, usually greater than 0.5 millimeters, and moderate to large NAs, so around 0.6 NA. High transmission is also very advantageous. So here you can see our spots are diffraction limited across the field of view. Our furthest out field produces an image at 0.581 millimeters, so double that for the field of view. And then here is our modulation transfer function. This black line is our diffraction limit. And you can see it's pretty good. And then here is the modulus of the OTF across the field of view. It's also pretty good. How did our design compare to our results? Now, remember, compared to an objective lens that you can purchase, that some of our requirements might be a little bit better. Those were the ones that we would emphasize, say, for our particular purpose or function. And some of them might have been relaxed a little bit. So originally, we tried to hit a numerical aperture of 0.5. We got 0.45. Magnification, we hit at 20. The field of view was very close. 1.2 was our design. Our results were 1.16. The transmission that we wanted was better than 80%. With 10 lenses, if we assume, therefore, 20 surfaces with 0.5% reflection per surface, we're going to get about 90% transmission. Our working distance, we wanted something that was about 12 millimeters. We did better than that. We got 14 millimeters. We matched parfocal. We did it in fewer lenses. Our focal length was a little bit longer, but the entrance pupil diameter was set. It works with a 200 millimeter um, tube lens, and we don't clip on the tube lens. So that looks great. Now here are our bill of materials. So I put the part numbers for all the lenses that I use for substitution, their unit price, and also the cost of coating. So all said and done, these optics are going to cost us about $1,000. The lenses themselves were only were under $500, but once you have them all coded, it brings it up to that $1,000. Now, what is the cost of the mechanics or the spacers? Well, that's to be determined. That's not something that we're going to present here. The tube lens, tube lenses are very inexpensive, but the spacers are something that are going to have to be custom made. Now the cost of an objective lens, a comparable objective lens that I was looking at from the catalog of Opto Sigma, was between $3,000 and $5,500. Now if you were trying to design something for which there was nothing close to or near equivalent, and you had to have a fully custom design, instead of $3,000 to $6,000, that could easily be $30,000 to $60,000 or more. Now, some things that we did not do is we didn't do a full stop analysis, that structural, thermal, optical. We obviously did a lot of optical, but there's still tolerancing that could be done. Um, we didn't do thermal and we didn't do structural. Now, it's worth noting that some of those things can be done also in the merit function, and you can put in sensitivity operands to help with the tolerancing and to create designs that are going to be more manufacturable. So I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and your attendance. I'd like to thank Opto Sigma, specifically Cindy Gong Harris and Yoko de Francia for organizing and advertising this event. Also, thank you to the CU system for their support and assistance in advertising. Finally, thank you to Jeff Squire, Don Dilworth, and Dave Schaefer, who have either directly or through their publications been instrumental to my lens design career. If you've enjoyed my presentation, 
please consider reaching out to me on LinkedIn and leaving me an endorsement. You can also contact me through email at michael.d.young at cuanschutz.edu or michael.dennis.young at outlook.com. At this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Michael, for your fantastic presentation. Uh, that was really great and informative. Um, notice that you mentioned Spheracon during your presentation. I just wanted to add that we do partner with them and sell their lenses and systems as well. Uh, let's go into questions. The first question is, Michael, how does your method or the method that you discussed on the webinar compare with traditional lens design methods? Um, so I, I, I don't want to say I came up with this method because I didn't. Obviously, you know, I referenced um, Berlin Brixner as being kind of the pioneer here. But I, I found this method when I was a, a newer lens designer and I was working in an environment where there really wasn't um, a lot of mentorship. And so it was kind of throw you in the deep end. And there wasn't a lot of company files. There weren't any company files. Um, and and so I read a lot of papers, particularly from Don Dilworth on kind of global optimization. And he has a great software package that he put together called Synopsys, not to be confused with Code 5. Um, and so I wanted to see, could I make that work for ZMAX? And, and it worked pretty well and it saw me through. So a more classical one would be, you know, you would start with um, some pre-existing design, or you would start with something that's very tried and true, like a, a cook triplet or something that's well known in the literature and try doing a global optimization from there or splitting a lens here or there, seeing if you can massage that previous design into something that's going to work for you. And that was just for what I was doing at the time, wasn't uh, an option. So, but that's, you know, it's still important to um, consider classical lens design principles. I mean, things like symmetry in a lens design, when can you take advantage of that? Um, where can you put a field flat, where can a field flattener go? What type of glasses are going to work for your design? So there's a lot of that kind of higher level design principle that's still very useful for this. Thank you, Michael. It looks like we have a lot of questions coming in. Uh, the next question is, how would you decide how many flat plates to start with? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so in this case, what I did is, since we were looking at a 95 millimeter par focal length objective, and we could say we wanted such and such a working distance, I had a fairly good idea of what volume I would have to work with for the lenses. I then looked through Opto Sigma's catalog of one inch lenses and said, well, the thickest lens is something like eight millimeters thick. And the, the thinnest lens would be something like two millimeters thick. And so I could take an average and say, you know, we could have as we could have around 12 lenses in that volume, assuming air gaps of, of such a such and such a thickness, like three to five millimeters. Um, and so that's a guess. And you run the global optimizer and you see how the performance is. And if you don't meet the performance, then you can say, well, or am I not meeting performance because I don't have enough surfaces or is it something else? And so at that point, you can think about introducing more lenses. And um, we wound, I wound up starting with fewer lenses than the initial requirement stated, hoping that um, after going through the global optimization and maybe splitting a few lenses, then it would be about right. And it was. So that's a, that's a great question. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the next question is, I didn't catch what wavelengths you were optimizing over. How does this method change, for example, designing an uh, acromat to work across the visible range? Oh, that's, um, that's a really good question. That, that depends on a lot of things. So when you're restricted to only a few glass types, making something that's achromatic is very difficult, particularly if it's a fast lens that has a high NA. 
So in this case, my assumption for the objective lens is that the excitation light is going to be monochromatic. That's the laser light. But the fluorescent light, if you're doing uh, multi-photon imaging, you might be imaging green fluorescent protein. So you'd be going in with 920 nanometer excitation light and looking at 520 nanometer uh, fluorescent light. Um, and so what I what my assumption there is that you don't need to necessarily have good resolution on that fluorescent light. You just need to be able to get it out of the objective lens and then split it off in the detection path with the dichroic. A lot of the time, the detection is going to be accomplished with something that's a single element detector, like a PMT that has a large detection area. And those are non-imaging, so you don't, need, you don't need a good diffracted spot. Now, I have done designs like this that were achromatic, but they were a lot slower. There are solutions out there. Uh, there's designs out there for single glass acromats and the global optimization would be able to find those as well. And then another option would be, these were all singlets. Um, once you have a, a design solution, maybe look at some of the focal length, uh, the focal lengths of the individual elements and try substituting in acromats that work for the wavelengths that you're interested in and then re-optimize and see how much of the achromatic performance can be performed using those, those achromatic solutions? That's a great question. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the next comment and question is, great talk, thanks. Do you have a rule of thumb for starting, starting number of elements? Um, I, I don't have a rule of thumb for the number of elements. Um, the design space is, is pretty large. The global optimization moves quickly enough that I'll start with, I'll try to start conservative. Um, if you give, if you give ZMAX or if you give an optical program more degrees of freedom, uh, it will, it'll use them and, you know, it'll put curvatures on those lenses, extra lenses that maybe you don't need. Sometimes what will happen, which is nice, is if you do have a design where you have too many lenses, one way that you can tell is that you'll have a lot of lenses that will have very weak power, or you might even have a few that have no power. And so you can try taking those out of the design and then do a linear re-optimization from that point to see if you really need that lens. Thank you. Great answer. The next question is, could you elaborate more on the tube lens of the 200 millimeter, of how that the 200 millimeter tube lens factored into your design parameters? Sure. So from a high level perspective, the, the reason for that was if you have a standard, you know, whatever standard means, but a, a microscope turret and you've got other objective lenses on there that are compatible with the 200 millimeter focal length tube lens, it would be nice to have your custom lens to be compatible with that same, um, that same tube lens. Now, ideally, what you would like to have is to know what that tube lens is, either have a black box design file or the actual design file from the manufacturer. If you don't, in this case, I didn't include uh, the tube lens in the design, but if you don't, one thing that you can include is an acromat or a triplet lens that has the same focal length and try to design around that. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. Next question is, can you elaborate, or no, I'm sorry, ask, I've already asked that one. So we have one more question. The final question is, Let's say that you've completed your design and then somebody says, that's nice, but can you make the field of view 20% bigger? You have to start from the beginning. You might have to start from the beginning. Um, that's, boy, whoever asked that question, that question, questions like that happen all the time. That's great, James. <laughs> I, um, the one that I remember getting a lot is usually, oh, you know, an NA of such and such is good, but 
more would be so much better. <laughs> um, So what I've presented here, I would say that yes, you would have to go back in and tweak your merit function to be able to, to capture that. Um, if you don't want to start completely from the beginning, then what you want to do is try and design to something that's in excess of your requirements initially. And, and that's something that's done. And that gives you some, some headroom on the design such that if a question like that comes up, you can go to the design and say, yeah, I do have that headroom on it. But there's a lot of other things to consider as well. Going back to, to something like the optical invariant, you know, an increased field of view is basically increasing the, the light collection ability of that optic. And, and that carries throughout the entire system. So some the, the Pat Trotta um, references are really good. He has a great story about designing an objective lens and facing similar questions to that from basically people in marketing. And the, the optical invariant very quickly shows that the ask is just impossible. So that's, that's also a good thing to consider is, you know, is it a realistic ask? Thank you, Michael. A couple more questions popped up. Uh, the next question is, is the ZMAX, ZMAX hammer optimizer useful as an alternative to the global optimizer for this for the project? Um, so the, the secret sauce, if you will, of how the global optimization algorithms work is, is not something that I know. Um, I believe that ZMAX uses a, a genetic algorithm for its global optimizer. At least they advertised that many, many years ago. A hammer optimizer uses different escape functions and it's also very useful. So what my design process usually is, is you find that global optimized solution that looks good and you start running with it and then you, you then you hand it over to the hammer optimizer to make sure that you're not stuck in some local minima for that more or less global solution. And then you go to the, the linear optimizer. And it's, it's very common to then alternate between the hammer and the linear. Now, when you're starting out with a that Berlin-Brixner parallel plate method, um, you can try the hammer. You can can try the linear, but my experience is that the global is going to give you a better, a better solution and it's a better place to start at the beginning. Thank you, Michael. Another question. Uh, I have a legacy custom objective 18x on which I want to replace a doublet. Can I pick a replacement doublet by just looking at the component performance or do I need an optimization package like ZMAX to optimize the entire objective? Mm, I'm not sure I, I'm quite clear on the question. So the, you have a, a legacy objective that's 18X, it was custom. So I guess you've got, you can remove a doublet from that custom objective. That sounds like maybe it was a Lister style objective with two two acromats in it. Um, can you pick a replacement doublet by just looking at the component performance or do you need an optimization package? That's, that's a difficult question to, to answer. Uh, Rudolf Kingslake had a, a saying that there's nothing quite so nonlinear as a lens. And what, what he meant by that is the the coupled performance of all the different surfaces is, is pretty horrendous. Um, you know, the experimentalist in me says a doublet's usually not very expensive. You can try and see. And the lens designer in, in me says, yeah, you need to, you need to look at the, the optical design and see if it will work. So you have an expectation of how the performance is gonna be. 
If it's a fairly low numerical ap aperture objective, then you can give it a shot. But if it's um, 0.4 or higher, it, you're going to be hard pressed to do that. Thanks, Michael. Uh, there is a question that I missed um, in the chat, I believe. I don't think we answered this. So if you design a UV lens, over what wavelength range will it be in focus? Um, so let me try to take that one in pieces. So I have done, I have done some UV lens design using this. And what I've presented here is particularly good for monochromatic designs. But if you are looking at different wavelengths, a lot of the times what you can do is if you can split the detection path, you can collect, um, let's say you're looking at different fluoresced wavelengths that are in the near UV. You can split the detection path and try to bring those to a focus on different detectors. That's, that's a possibility. Um, yeah, that's, that's a difficult question just because I don't have a good way of saying what the spectrum is or how achromatic we're trying to perform or what what the speed of the lenses we're trying to use. So, you know, cop out answer, it depends. Um, if you're doing something that's a really, a really slow optic, um, a really, really high F number, then you can get pretty good achromatic performance over a modest range. And um, I did a, a beam delivery design one time that was over a couple hundred nanometers and it was achromatic, but that was like F70. So, I mean, incredibly slow. The more, the big difficulty with UV design is the limited, um, the limited glass that you can use. Thank you, Michael. We still have questions. I'm sorry, we still have questions coming in. Sure. Next question is, what process do you use for finding matching COTS lenses? Do you use ZMAX or directly refer to the product manual? Um, I go directly to the product manual. I've looked at the Opto Sigma lenses enough that I have a pretty good idea if a BK7, um, oh, um, Opto Sigma uses O'Hara, so it's BSL lens is going to work uh, with the catalog or a few silica lens is going to work. I have used ZMAX's uh, Cots lens substitution tool before, and I find that I can I can find the solutions faster. So, the 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 big difficulty with the the ZMAX one is um, it's it's got an additional constraint there on clear aperture, and so sometimes it will eliminate lenses that are suitable. I've used that before, it does work. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we have another question. This may be the last one. Do you have any sort of shorthand or rule of thumb to assess whether a given design specification is reasonable or even possible? For example, uh, combination of NA, field color, et cetera. Oh, sure. Um, so the first, the first thing to look at is to calculate the optical invariant and, and see how that goes throughout the system. Again, I really recommend you look at Pat Trotta's articles that are in the presentation. Um, he addresses that exact thing of, you know, what if you're uh, designing an objective lens and you're given magnification and field of view and um, a numerical aperture? And how does that then translate to, say, the eyepiece or something like that? So the optical invariant is the best tool for kind of the first sanity check on an optical design. And, uh, you know, in my experience, a, a real simple way to look at that is the product of the numerical aperture and um, your field of view gives you a pretty good initial guess. 
you, Michael. Um, and then, and then color, you know, as long as you're not in the, as long as you're staying out of the, the near UV, uh, visible and the near infrared are pretty amenable to most solutions. There's a lot of glass out there. UV is where it gets difficult. Thank you, Michael. It looks like we're done with our question and answer portion. Um, everybody asked great questions and you had excellent answers and I appreciate that and I'm sure our listeners do as well. Um, once again, thank you very much for being our guest speaker today. Uh, please email any additional questions either to Michael or you can email them to OptoSigma um, at sales at OptoSigma.com. Once again, there is a recorded version available, so we'll follow up with the link. And I hope you enjoyed today's session. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Bye.